bar and so these are at 60 right in the middle and so 60 on the and 60 on the wooden scale and the diamond scale is right in the middle and so if you start going up 70 80 90 100 you start going down the direction and as you start going 30 whatever you're going to direction you'll have to plot your numerator so plot your numerator on here and so the goal is really like a progression because it's just the wood and the chunk level looks like this the tip of the just the progression protest despair <laughs> so, so when you're working with people, so what if you have, what do you think is the most common relationship? Of the different styles. Mm -hmm. One secure, one avoided. One secure and avoided? Not usually. That's a good guess. I'll show you why in a minute. <laughs> Anxious to avoid. Anxious and avoidant. Yes. Yes, 
two, two attachment systems activated at the same time. And it's usually they're, they're, they're activating each other. Like the threat, for example, something outside of the film, then I'm the threat. We'll talk about how to deal with that. It's really tricky because how do you stay, how do you reach and also reach and also give? How do you receive and give at the same time? It's much easier when one person is deactivated and the other person is activated. Attachment systems activated are carried in the system. Then we have the general relationship to the same state for a while. We're threatened by someone else's need. If we're insecurely attached, we're threatened by the person's need, then our attachment system is activated. So if answer is no to this, symbolically or actually, insecurity is bigger and there's what's called compounded stress. So this is the difference between pain and suffering. Suffering is a state of compounded stress. It's a lack of response to one's social caregiver that turns you into think what is painful and makes you suffer. And so now you're in a state of compounded, hyperactivated. So whatever emotion you were feeling in response to this threat or pain by the pain, because it's in the state of suffering. And then you move into the question of, is proximity is being a viable option? Can I get my attachment to your close? And if intuitively, at some level, you believe that you can, then you move into what's called hyperactivity strategy. That's like throwing our dog a shimmy. It's like a major protest to get their attention. So if you're not getting attention, tell them to shake a fist, tell them to scream, tell them to yell, tell them to get your attention, or raise it up to this level. And then, if I get your attention, Good though to get down here and have to use this strategy. Now, if you've tried this for a couple times and it doesn't work, then you just automatically go to zero. It's straight to hyperactivation. Now, if proximity thinking isn't a viable option, no matter how much I protest, how much I yell, I go to no, now I'm using this deactivating strategy to shut off the entire system and deactivating strategy is not good. It just brings in more emotion, it carries it away. Right? It's shutting it down. I have to shut it down. I can no longer count on anybody else to shut it down. This is the only system that, sh that is self-reliant. Everything else is still reliant on another. The actual strategies are self-reliant. I will shut it down. I will create a way to shut this down. My mind will dissociate from my experience in order to shut this down. This is very, very dangerous. So I think a lot of our addictions are just deactivating strategies. We try to plot all the different individual categories. Any questions about that system? It happens over and over and over again. You can bypass it. So if you're avoiding it, you just jump right into the activating strategy. If I, if I come to you and I'm upset, and I just go numb. And I stare at you, and I look through you like a nice thing comes through. All right, so the more and more activated you get, the more and more distant I become. And so finally you learn that no matter how mad you get, I'll stay, still stay distant until again you turn into you start to deactivate that too. Because I can't just stay in this tension of compounded distress with no alleviation of that stress through the relationship. It's got to deactivate it. Right? We can't stay, our attachment systems can't stay activated all the time. We've got to get a way to turn it off. It takes too much, too much resources of the cell to just keep it on. It's only meant to be there for threat. But kids who are in constant internal and external threat, or adults who are constant internal and external threat, the attachment system is on a way too much, low, 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 way too high, and um, and they suffer all the time. They're tired, they're burnt out, they're sick because the attachment system is always monitoring. Um, people also have been to war. It's like PTSD. Attachment system activation all the time. It's like PTSD. You're always on alert for threat. And your body's always preparing for threat and response. Anything else you want to add about? Um, so dissociation.
too with chronic pain too, by the way. If anyone in here has chronic pain, one of the best ways to treat chronic pain is to have other stimulation. Like if you're going in for, if your kid's going in for um, a shot, the best way to help them is to tap them. Because oh. you're sending actual signals through the pain sensors up into the brain, which are paying attention to that and are blocking other pain signals. My mother-in-law, she's got a chronic pain, and so she has this pillow that she puts on her back that vibrates all the time, and it relieves her pain a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just tricking your brain. So your brain can only handle so much pain stimulation, and so people cut and do things like that in order to be able to manage their own pain. Okay, so this is gonna go really quick. Adult attachment and personality disorders. Um, so here's the dependent personality disorder. I rely on others to fulfill my, my professional ideas. Adjustment needs, which is interesting. Obsessive compulsive, I demand perfection of myself prior to developing attachments with others. I must prove my competency. Histrionic, I require attention from others to feel attached and worthwhile. Avoidant, I avoid others out of fear of rejection because attachments, attachments are risk and I want to be loved. Paranoid, I'm afraid that others will take advantage of any attachments that I, I form with them. I'm scared for being alone. Antisocial, I'm unlovable, therefore I must be tough and destroy all potential attachments. Narcissistic, I sabotage all attachments through my unrelenting egocentrism while I'm desperately insecure. This is really interesting. I pulled up the DSM-5 for today and we have a bunch of unique protocols. But don't show up and meets all the criteria. You have to show up and meets five. If you meet five of the ten, he meets every single criteria for narcissistic. Not that I've interviewed him or not that I can say that with assurance. But I can tell you that the way he's behaving, I'm not even saying that, I'm not saying you can't be narcissistic and be effective. Schizotypal, I am very unique and attached to my world. And the schizo is a world that's not responsible for my attachment to the civilized outlet. And then there's the blue and on a personal favorite. I desperately need to be in close attachments. I destroy all attachments. I have very few attachments at all. You know, borderline, we'll go back to that diagram, right? Anxious and avoidant. The line, I go back and forth. I blur the line. So I go up into anxious, clingy, needy. I want you, I need you, I love you, don't leave me. And as soon as you get close, I go to punish you, right? And those are people that are disorgan disorganized attachments. They've never tapped the stop. They've been not, not given any space for attachment. They're mostly go back and forth. And the reason they're disorganized is typically because their protector was their persecutor. So they're disorganized in their attachments because the brain doesn't know how to process that. So it's really common for people with borderline personality disorders to have that child protective needs by the parent. Or maybe through trauma by some of those disorders. So why don't you guys think about how does all attachment relate to temperature, turbulence, and pursue withdrawal patterns? Can you see it now? Right? What kind of attachment style? Can you, can you 